All right, we are joined now by Steve Krakauer, who has a new book, Uncovered, How the Media Got Cozy with Power, Abandoned Its Principles, and Lost the People. Steve, thanks for being here. Hey, guys. Great to be on with you. Yeah, I mean, this book is so needed now, Steve, I think, because the media is just losing trust at an all-time rate. I mean, it's it's been losing it for some time now, but I think there's just been a gallon or two of gasoline dumped on that fire that was already happening. Um, so it's really accelerated, but there's such a fire hose of information out there now too, Steve, that, um, you know, you see mistakes being made, but it just, it just quickly just gets discarded and we're moving on to the next thing. And the mob is moving on to the next thing and no one goes back and look at, looks at this stuff, but that's exactly what you've done here, right? Yeah, that's what I try to do. Absolutely. I, I do. I, I agree with you. I, I think, look, I, I've spent a lot of time in the media myself. I was uh, kind of a media insider myself working at places like CNN and NBC, as well as places like Fox and, and The Blaze. Um, but there was always valid criticisms, I would say, of places like CNN and The New York Times and others uh, 10, 15 years ago. But something really fundamental changed in the last five to seven years, which is really what I track in the book. And we see it in poll after poll. I mean, the 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 right has generally always been a bit distrustful of mainstream media, corporate press. But in since 2017, the the cliff, that independent line, the independent line has completely fallen off of, I mean, cut 50% in many cases. And a, a recent poll of just TV news, trust in TV news, has Republicans trusting TV news at an 8% level, just eight, and independents trusting TV news at an 8% level. It's completely the same. And so something really major happened there that is not necessarily even based on political bias, but goes much deeper than that. And I think we saw this with so many stories, COVID in particular, I spent a lot of time on COVID in the book. Um, and yes, I, I think my main point in doing this was to figure out what happened, to really kind of dig in and understand why it happened and make sure the audience understands that there are some some very nuanced, complicated reasons that these mistakes get made, that they don't get corrected, that we move on to the next thing. And then so that you can be armed with what you need to know for when it happens in the future, the kind of the red flags to look for. So you know when it happens again. Yeah, you know, for decades, people have been complaining about bias, particularly on the right, as you said. It is interesting because once, you know, Trump was in office, it felt like, and I'm not saying it was just Trump, but it felt like there was a real shift where a lot of the complaints or the things that have been talked about, you were starting to see them and it was very visceral. I mean, it was very obvious. It wasn't something you could even argue about. Why why do you think that happened during the, you know, maybe the Trump administration? Yeah, there's again, I mean, I think there's so many factors to it. But I, I was having this conversation last week with someone where I, I said, if you know, Twitter is a very new phenomenon, right? Twitter it basically was invented in 2009, uh, was popularized around 2011, 2012. So we're not talking about a huge amount of time that this, this platform has been around. So let's just imagine a world where Twitter didn't exist. It just that one didn't get invented. What would have the Trump administration coverage have looked like in during that time? And I, I would argue it actually would have been been significantly different because so much of what happened during those those five years or so when it was running for office and then became president was the performative nature that came from Twitter. Also, the incentive structure that comes from Twitter. You know, the way and I, I talk to people, uh, more than two dozen people on the record in my book, including people that are kind of in the mainstream media, people like Tara Palmieri at Puck News, Olivia Nuzzi at New York Magazine. And a lot of them point to this idea where people went after the Trump administration in very showy, dramatic, performative ways because of the accolades they would get on social media, particularly on Twitter, the incentive of getting new followers and new likes. Likewise, they would not cover certain stories or cover them certain ways because of the fear of backlash that they might get on Twitter, especially during the Trump years. And so you have this, this in into the, the current mix of what already existed. You have Trump, who I do think that there's there's some business element to what happened there. You know, he was great for business. And so, okay, let's lean into that. There was something personal about it as I track in the book. I mean, Jeff Zucker was essentially made, the, the president of CNN at the time was made by Donald Trump when he, they were at NBC together when doing Celebrity Apprentice. They were, you could 
kind of say friends. I mean, he was at his wedding along with Katie Couric and Gail King from CBS and Chris <laughs> Matthews. I mean, you go right on down the line. I mean, the, he was part of that world and he became this turncoat to them. And then I think you put into that a very real sense, as ridiculous as the three of us may think it is, that people in those newsrooms believed they were in this existential fight to save democracy during the Trump years, that it was Watergate every day for them. And so <laughs> when you enter that, I would argue that if you believe that, as I certainly do not, you would double down on your principles. Okay, that would be the time we need to really stick to our principles. But instead, they went the other direction. Guardrails were off. Suddenly, oh, you don't need two sources. No, we just need one. Eh, we kind of let's just let's just run with it. Oh, this this outlet has something. Let's just do that for twenty four hours. So they they believed that they were in this fight, and in response to that, they decided to say it's just too big of an issue. Let's just let's just go with with the principles we used to have. Those are gone out the window. Yeah, hundred percent. And you right at the beginning of the book, you know, you go through the the laptop story and you yeah. break that thing down and show it. And that is a prime example of what you're talking about. And the media has always had, I think, you know, we've seen it from the Rush Limbaugh days of exposing it in the nineties of just kind of a liberal bias. And so we've known about that. And that's that's kind of a well known thing. But it seems like it transitioned, as you were saying, from biased to activism at some point. Now, I always pinpointed this, and I'm interested to get your take because I think you have a different date for me uh, th from what I have. I, I kind of look at the George Floyd scenario along with Trump, as you were saying, as sort of these catalysts to bring us into just, they just think this is too important and we're willing to shut down a story and ignore a story because it's for the greater good. And they kind of went into that mode where they didn't do that before. But you even went back further and point to 2014 and Michael Brown. Yeah. Why is that? Right. Yeah, I, I really did try to figure out what that was. And I think that it was a combination. I think Trayvon Martin on some level started it, but it was a little bit more where, look, I was at CNN during Trayvon Martin. So I, I understand that there was a sense by many people in that newsroom to get that story right. But by 2014, and again, I was outside at that point of CNN, that really was the catalyst, I believe, to, to start this. And as you point out, this was before Trump. This was before the elevator ride and, he's, and he kicked off his campaign. So something else shifted there. And, and that story became so much about hands up, don't shoot, right? That was the what Michael Brown supposedly said. And in fact, I would imagine many people on all sides of the aisle still believe that Michael Brown said that. And yet, as we now know, he didn't say that. We know that because of the Obama Justice Department's investigation that they did only a year later. So we're talking about 2015 completely disproved that. No witnesses said he said that. Instead, actually, he charged at uh, Officer uh, Darren Wilson. He, he reached for the gun. It was not a racially motivated shooting, as we now know. That was looked into as well. And so all of these factors, and yet the response from the media was not to say, we got this so excruciatingly wrong. In some cases, it was, as I pointed out. But in other cases, it was Hands Up, Don't Shoot wasn't really about what it was actually said. It was about the rallying cry that it started, the social justice movement that began from that. It became more of a symbol. That's the direction, not just of the activists, but of the media themselves. And when you have narrative over fact, as that story ended up becoming, that's what seeded the ground for what was to come during the Trump years. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Billy, real quick before you get to your question, another one I'll add on there is the Don't Say Gay bill yeah. in Florida with DeSantis. It, the bill says nothing of that extent. You can argue about the bill all you want, but it was very interesting to me that every media outlet le called it the don't say gay bill. And that was an, I don't even know who coined that phrase. I mean, some activists somewhere must have coined it, but it got all picked up by all of these outlets. And you would think somewhere, some journalist, some, you know, person, a producer somewhere in the newsroom would say, hey, uh, what is that? Why, why would we call it that? Um, and I think yeah. a lot of the things you cover in the book, all these different influences that are happening in our media um, explain a lot of that. Yeah, 100 percent. I, I think that 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 one was started by an activist, uh, as you as you mentioned, and then it just became this the media is so concerned about misinformation these days. Right. That just became this casual misinformation that was spread on all of the corporate media outlets. And in fact, it was one of the things that was interesting. You know, Chris Licht took over about a year ago, took over CNN and his mandate was to insert news back into there after the, the hole that Jeff Zucker, I think, left the network in. And one of the things that was reported that, that he cited was just the idea of 
of not calling it the don't say gay bill. You can still cover it. You could say it's, you know, you hate the bill or whatever, but just using that term is is a bias that is inserted unnecessarily and and just eliminating that is a very small step towards like the right direction yeah you know one of the things that comes up a lot in this debate in this discussion is that a lot of conservatives will say the media they're out to get us it's intentional that people are sitting in a room and they're conjuring up ways to go after people on the right or christians or other groups of people um, and then there's sort of another side to that, which is that maybe there's an ignorance or a lack of introspection, which I know you talk about in the book. Can you speak to that dynamic to maybe help people understand what drives this? How do we get to a place where every outlet is saying the don't say gay bill? Right. A hundred percent. I think that some stories, you know, the Hunter Biden laptop one, which you mentioned, I, I started the book with that. That one is a very real case of a conspiracy between uh, the tech platforms, between the intel agencies and the media. That one was the kind of collusion that we talk about. But in so many other stories, and, and I would say most of the stories where where things get covered in an incorrect way or or you know mistakes get made it's not that you know it's dead as you mentioned it's it's ignorance it's incompetence uh it's laziness and and i i lay out many stories like that throughout the book where uh look journalism is is a very unique occupation you know it's not like if you had a plumber you know you were looking to get a plumber you would look at the yelp reviews and you would say okay this one you know has some great yelp reviews and this one this one does, doesn't do great work and you would there would be like a meritocracy to it people would get weeded out and you would get and the best ones would bubble to the top journalism doesn't work like that at all in fact it's almost the opposite some uh, very often the worst journalists get rewarded and the best ones you know get get for a lot of reasons because they maybe cover things in an unacceptable way socially get pushed to to a side so it that because of that in that environment so many mistakes get made that are just more about a general incompetence, laziness, maybe a little bit fear also, fear of backlash from, from other places. That's why these things happen. And it's important to kind of note that also. How do these get made and, and understand why that might happen in the future? Do you think, Steve, that the media industry in, in general is redeemable? Because there's so many different factors, like you're saying, it's kind of like the economy, right? You can't just say, well, it's this one policy here that's making the economy go down. It, it can right. contribute to it. Um, like, like you said, the laziness, the, the laziness, then you have some activists, but then, but then there's just the system where it's, and then also to the incentive for clicks, like there's, there's a difference now between media in the nineties and, and, and beyond, and, you know, around that era where you didn't have this pressure to get instant clicks on a story. You can instantly see when one's doing well or when one's doing yeah. not not so well so how is it redeemable we've got all these things going on and clearly it's not going in the right direction do, do you think that it can be fixed and if so what are the sorts of things that need to need to happen so the short answer is that I'm I'm a I'm an optimist generally I'm a glass half full person um, I I think that that there's a path for the media getting better um, and I uh, at the same time am not holding my breath for it to happen look these are giant corporations in many instances it's like a tanker trying to move that around it's going to take a very long time even if their head was in the right place which I would imagine you know for the most part they're not look Donald Trump is running again. He's ahead, certainly, in a lot of the primary polls mm -hmm. right now. This is going to be very difficult for a media, even if they wanted to try to, to, to you know, get rid of those bad habits that they had in, in you know, the 2015 to 2020. It's going to be very hard for them to do that. But I think one of the reasons that I'm optimistic is because many people are, are opening their eyes to this. And, and again, it's not political. I think people I talk to here in Texas on the left, uh, people that are Democrats, people that are even consumers of these mainstream outlets are understanding that these these places are not telling it to them straight, that they can't just go to one source and understand that that's the news anymore. Um, they need to kind of broaden that out. They're finding independent media in a lot of instances, and that's serving them in ways that they they sort of are starting to see, okay, this is feeling closer to me. This is feeling more true. This is feeling like they're, they're, they're talking to me and treating me like uh, I deserve more information. And so because of that, I do think that the bottom line is really being affected these days at places like a CNN or ESPN, I mentioned in the book, New York Times, when the bottom line starts hitting, and it's not just the bottom line of of you know being able to try to find new viewers somewhere else, but but literally the trust factor that that the the lack of trust is hurting the bottom line. 
I do think that that it's going to it's going to change some executives to start making decisions that are at least in the best interest of their audience, which they should be doing at first. That's a step in the right direction. It's going to take a while, though, but I do think that that those areas could get them back in the right way. Yeah, I know we're rounding out towards the end of our time, but but I have to ask too about the way that journalists are even trained. You know, I know for me when I went to journalism school, you know, we were taught that basically you're going to be middle of the road. This is who you are. You your your thoughts are as pure as snow. Keep them as white as snow. I remember these weird quotes about basically how you didn't have any opinions, and I remember thinking that's not true. We all have, everybody sitting in this room has an opinion right now. And yet we're kind of being taught that we're middle of the road, even though we're not. And there seems to be some danger to that, right? You live in New York City, let's say, and you only know liberals, but yet you've been taught that you're this middle of the road person when you're really a liberal. I mean, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, but it would seem to influence even the stories you pick, how you do it, how you do your job. I, I think that's one of the biggest problems. I would call it like a geographic bias because to be honest, you know, even those people would think that when in the New York City bubble and the DC bubble, they know conservatives, right? They know, at least they would know Republicans, but those are, they are closer, those maybe New York City Republicans are closer to the liberals of New York City than the liberals in places like Texas or in Iowa or in Kansas. It's completely disconnected because it's not really as much about politics as it's about culture, as it's about this idea of being disconnected from the average person's way of life, even the way the person you know interacts with the people around them, with their communities that they're in, with the churches that they're in, with with their 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 groups, the people that they hang out with, their families. Um, it's it's a total disconnect, and I think in some ways it got worse during COVID because of the lockdown and everyone kind of got siloed in their in their homes, especially on the East Coast. But in other ways, I would hope that that's our way out of it because one of the the positives I think in the media with COVID was this idea that work from home is really possible in in many instances. They don't need to fly everyone to the New York City newsroom anymore. They can be in their communities already. And I hope that really does start to be a, a, a way of getting out of this. If they can say, you live here and you can stay there, you can stay in that community. You don't have to go and become essentially indoctrinated into the New York way of life. Stay there, be a reporter in that area. I think that would go a long way because, because right, that by being in those those silos, they are missing so much of the country, so much of the conversation, and, and the way that the that the current mood of the country is right now. Mm. That's a great point. I mean, because I think one of the things, if we're we're talking about how do we fix this, is just honestly representing the other side. And I think largely in the media, you get a caricature of what a conservative is. You know, you get yeah. this you know redneck hick who who doesn't know anything about anything. They're just waving their MAGA flag and they're a bunch of idiots. And, um, or, you know, you get the fire breathing preacher who's just yelling Bible verses at gay people. And, um, it's just not an, a, a, a fair or honest, you know, reflection of who conservatives are. And you see that through just things like on policy debates. Well, this debate, don't say gay. It's, it's this right. bill's going to harm gay. Like they just buy into so many times narratives over, actually representing what the other side is saying. Like you don't have to agree or disagree with those points, but how about we just honestly represent what each side is saying? I mean, I, I think you win over audiences that way. That's like a Tim Russert effect, right? Tim Russert used to yeah. go right at people with the toughest arguments against them. And, it, and people love Tim Russert for that. Yeah, Tim Russert, you know, again, not that long ago that he was the uh, the moderator of Beat the Press, uh, but but it felt like a completely different era because right, Tim was from Buffalo, New York, you know, yes, also New York, but but a very different kind of New York than New York City. <laughs> and he had that ethos to him. You know, he he treated people respectfully. He really I think the the goal of journalism should be, you know, it's the fourth estate. It should be the conduit for the people and a check on power. And instead, the fact that they've gotten cozy with power during this time, gotten farther away from the people than close to the people, that is a huge er error in their ways. And it shows in so many other examples. It shows just in the way that they, that they, they, they the stories they focus on, how they cover them, that just getting back to the mentality of serving the people, of, of, of trying to represent all views uh, at fairly, understanding them, being at least curious about them, that would go a long way also. So, you know, last question for me on on the book here. What are you hoping it accomplishes? What are you hoping people walk away with after they're done reading it? 
Yeah, look, I, I really hope that people understand that that we as a country are stronger by being on the same page. Look, a lot of this, I, I think, when in writing it is to kind of show the cards face up on the table. Say, this is what happened. This is why it happened. Try to explain because as someone who's been in those newsrooms, this is almost like how it happened also. Try to categorize things and say, we don't need the corporate press necessarily to get better in order to stay informed and to stay connected as a country. Uh, here's what to look for when this happens again, because it will happen again in the future. And now let's let's band together and, and go around the gatekeepers. Hmm. Well, Steve Krakow, I appreciate you spending a few minutes here. The book is Uncovered, How the Media Got Cozy with Power, Abandoned Its Principles, and Lost the People. I, I think it's a critical read um, today because, like I said at the beginning, you just don't, people don't take the time to stop and give a real assessment of what's going on. They just think, ah, eh, it's terrible, it's bad, and then we, you know, they move on. Or people just keep consuming this stuff through the fire hose and accept things and narratives as reality. So, Great book and appreciate you uh, stopping by and chatting for a few minutes about it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.